Hello and welcome to another episode of Into the Afroverse. I am your host, William Jones, and Into the Afroverse is where we take black folks into the future. say this and and I want to start off by saying I want to thank everyone that's been tuning in. I really appreciate the support that I've been getting. This show is brand new and the feedback that I've gotten, the guests that I've gotten uh, has just been this great ride and I just want to continue uh, with this ride. So I encourage all of you, you know, that are listening, turn your friends on, let them know what's going on uh, in terms of our conversations around Afrofuturism. And when I talk about guests and I talk about special guests, being excited for guests, really excited for today's guest. Uh, today's guest is Mr. John Jennings. Uh, John Jennings is a professor, author, graphic novelist, curator, Harvard Fellow, New York Times bestseller, 2018 Eisner Award winner. That's like the Academy Award for you know cartoon, uh, uh, comic illustrators and graphic artists, and an all-around champion of Black culture. Love that. As a professor of media and cultural studies, At the University of California at Riverside, UCR, Jennings examines visual culture of race in various media media forms, including film, illustrated fiction, and comics and graphic novels. He is also the director of Abrams Comic Arts imprint, Megascope, which publicizes graphic novels focused on the experiences of people of color. His research uh, interests include visual culture of hip-hop, Afrofuturism, and politics visual literacy, horror, and ethnogothic, and speculative design, and its applications to a visual rhetoric. Jennings is co-editor of the 2016 Eisner Award-winning collection, The Black of the Ink, Constructions of Black Identity in Comics and Sequential Art, and is the co-founder and organizer of the Schomburg Center, the Black Comic Book uh, Festival in Harlem. He is the co-founder and organizer of the MLK NorCal's Black Comics Art Festival in San Francisco, and also SoulCon, the Brown and Black Comic Expo at the Ohio State University. And with that, once again, I'd like to welcome Mr. John Jennings. How you doing today? Thank you so much, man. That was a great intro. I mean, I know it's, it's the bio, but, you know, people read it different, you know? <laughs> so, right, right, right. But no, no, thank you. So thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate you being here. And like I said, man, you know, um, when I have certain folks on, or well, really all my guests, you know, I get these different perspectives and different angles and so forth. And with you, it's this combination of the artistic side, the academic side, the planning side, where you're putting together programs to promote mm-hmm. people. So I really like the way that you kind of brought all of this together. So like I said, really excited to have you here. Thank uh, you. Just to get things started, you know, um, once again, we're talking about Into the Afroverse. And the angle here, the perspective here is Afrofuturism. And when I ask people, what does Afrofuturism mean to them? For all of the guests, I get just as many answers. So in terms of the way you came into it and your understanding of it, what does Afrofuturism mean to you? You know, that's a great question. First of all, I think <clears throat> like a lot of people, it probably started from more of an aesthetic, right? Uh, because, you know, how, how does uh, there was a teacher of mine, Doyle Moore, who used to always say that, um, insiders see content, outsiders see form, right? Insiders see content, outsiders see form. So, you know, before you get into a particular culture, you're, you're an outsider. You're just kind of coming to it and you start consuming something through, you know, what it looks like, you know what I'm saying? And I think that's with uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of cultures that we, we like what something looks like, but, you know, but, but everything, when you think about like a style, mm-hmm. a style is really a system of decisions and the style is like the formal, uh, index of a decision-making process. You see what I'm saying? So that's so a lot of times that style or that that uh, that system is something that we're not privy to at first. Mm-hmm. So the first time I came across Afrofuturism as a concept had to be like early 2000s, like 2007, 2008. I was um, 
I had done like some work as a uh, a visiting artist uh, at uh, James Madison University, and they had this thing called a Diversity Artists in Residence. You know, right, right. I was the first. I was the first one, and you know, in the, in the academy, you know, you you in education, you throw you throw the word diversity in there, and you know, you might be able to get some money for something, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so so they brought me in, and I did some work there with their students and stuff. A couple of weeks, it was nice, and then you get a show the next year where you actually come back to the school and you actually do like an exhibition or something. Mm -hmm. So I have been really interested in like Japanese techno culture and manga, stuff like that. And then I had, I think I've recently reread um, the uh, white, uh, black skin, white masks, you know, okay. the uh, France for oh. piece. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've been really interested in like stereotypes. So I started making these like black, cyborg images you know and then a friend of mine uh dana rush who was an africanist that used to work at university at the time i was still at university of illinois teaching and design and she said hey those look really afrofuturist and i was like that is i've never heard of that <laughs> like what, is, what does that mean you know and so when i started doing some digging around i realized like oh okay so we are talking about like how black people utilize science fiction and technology uh metaphors for like issues around agency, you know? So it was really like about, around like black people and technology. And, you know, when you look at Mark Derry's um, original definition of it, uh, there's several things that are interesting. Like one is like, what is technology, right? Another one is like, he mentions uh, African-American concerns, which I thought was interesting. So he's not necessarily talking about the diaspora, right? you know, writ large, you know, in that particular definition. And then he also says 20th century techno culture, which I thought was interesting too, because you know, this is 1993 when he's writing about this. So, yeah, so I think I started out as a researcher and I started and I started being very interested in the different aspects of it. And now I realize it's more of an epistemology. It's a way of seeing the world, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's Black speculative, you know, uh, creativity from various standpoints. It's not just literature, it's dance, it's politics, it's religion. It's, a, like I said, it's epistemology. But it centers black. It, it, it's it's Afrocentric in nature, so blackness is at the center of it. And the future, I think, in this particular case of late, I've thought of it mostly as a destination. You know, um, I think I think the future is something that is a very very you know uh, powerful notion of black people in the future and having agency over what that future will be. You know, right? And as you know, I mean, we've always used. Uh, creativity as ways to fight back against oppression. And I think that this is just another iteration of what has come before, you know? Got you. Yeah. So that's kind of like a long-winded way to say it, but I was, um, so right now I'm thinking like this is the, the aesthetic and cultural revolution that's connected to this current uh, iteration of like black uh, positivity and black politics. Cause if you look at it, you know, you have something like the Black Arts Movement that was connected to the Black Power Movement, right? Right. But you had a lot of people in the Black Black Arts Movement who were writing speculative fiction, right? Right. Uh, there's a handful of really powerful poets and people, people like, you know, uh, Henry Dumas and like Amir Baraka, people like that. They were writing sci-fi and fantasy, right? And then, of course, before that, you have the, the New Negro Movement, which, of course, is connected to the Har Har well, Harlem Renaissance, right? Right. And you have Du Bois is writing science fiction, people like George Shiler, even though he's not necessarily part of the Harlem Renaissance, he was kind of opposed to it a little bit, but still he was writing science fiction and satire. So, you know, we, we have a long history of, of Black people, even before the term science fiction is even coined, by the way, right. writing science fiction and fantasy work. And mostly it's talking about liberation and utilizing the Black radical imagination <coughs> to think about better ways of living, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, I say the same thing when people ask me about Afrofuturism, and I find this often, that we were already that, mm -hmm. we just didn't know it had a name, or a right. name hadn't been created yet, you know, so I always find it interesting that this is something that, you know, for yourself, you were already there, and then you find out, you know, that someone came up with some phrase for it, and I think yeah. it's important to talk about the fact that this is something we've always been doing. That's right. No, and that's and that's exactly right. I mean, you know, not only what if you think about it, you know, if you just be really like maybe even more philosophical about it. I mean, we, our ancestors, you know, if you're if you're uh, descended from people who were enslaved Africans, right? Mm -hmm. This country were treated as technology, 
Right. Like, like we like our ancestors were the 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 extensions of 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 the master's whim, so to speak. Right. And as such, you know, we're treated like replaceable parts. You know, right. I mean, so if this particular part breaks down, you buy another slave. You know, you stick it into the wicket. You know, that right. into the widget. You know, so we were treated as um, machines. You know, soft yes. machines. And so I thought it was really interesting is that uh, Afrofuturism, a lot of the ideas are around uh, not only naturalizing Afrocentric technologies that have already existed, as you're stating, but also thinking about periods of agency around like how we invented, you know, uh, technology and actually use them. Right. Ways of thinking to, to to liberate ourselves through that technology. You see what I'm saying? And so that's right. that's what I like about it, this idea of like, well, let's expand what technology is and then let's let's see how that technology can actually push into other areas and actually free ourselves, you know? I hear you, I hear you. So once again, if you're just tuning in, this is Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, and today we're joined by John Jennings. So you kind of dealt with, I guess, my next question. What is it about it that you think has connected with so many people? I mean, it looks as if, you know, I won't say overnight, but certainly very rapidly, you're seeing Afrofuturism being touted in many spaces, you know, and, and as people are hearing about it and they're connecting with it, it's sticking. So mm -hmm. it's like, what is it to you? And like I said, you kind of touched on it, but what else do you think there is in terms of why it's become so popular and why so many people are gravitating towards it? We well, you know, it's interesting because it's funny. You said it's like overnight. And I was like, yeah, nah. <laughs> I think about like, it's kind of like, we're, you know, Afrofuturism is overnight su success. Like Beyonce was overnight success. Right. You know <laughs> right. Whereas like, not, not at all, actually. She, right. She's been, she worked really, really hard <laughs> exactly. for many, many years. And um, it's interesting because the term, like I said, is coined in like the 1990s, but it doesn't really, it really doesn't really sink in and catch on. And I think what it was is like the 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 way that we're thinking about technology is still far advanced than what the, than what the computer technology was. I think mm -hmm. you know because if you think about it, like that original uh, article was really about the nascent uh, World Wide Web. You know, saying what the web is still uh, in its infancy, right? And I think what was what was happening is like you had black nerds, you know, who were really into this stuff, but they were very scattered. We were, we were all over the place and we, right. we were alone, right? So I would say that this particular iteration that my friend Ronaldo Anderson calls Afrofuturism 2.0 right. um, really starts with the election of Barack Obama. Really? Know? I think so. I think, yeah, because because here's the thing. So you have people like, that's one of the, that's one of the, the, the touchstones. Because if you right. think about it, like the only time you see a black president was in a science fiction story. <laughs> that's true. And, and, and it's usually like, about the end of the world. <laughs> and usually about the end of the world and usually played by, um, and usually played by uh, uh, Morgan Freeman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? So, 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 but, you know, my friend Jabari Asim, he said that he has this book called What Obama Means, right? He puts forth that one of the reasons why Obama could get elected is because of the fact that we had so many black leading men now, you see. Okay. So what happens is like America as a as a, the American consciousness had gotten used to Sidney Poitier and Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington and Eddie Murphy, you know, being like these leading men. And so we start to create an idea of a future, you know, for, for America to be like a free place. Right. Then you need to see women and minorities leaders you see what i'm saying like if you look at like star trek and stuff like that these are notions of like what a free space look like when everybody has power you see mm -hmm. and i think that's part of it so when you see a, a barack obama who's a big nerd and a big star trek nerd right. right you're like wait this dude is nerdy but he's cool but he's also super smart like oh wait we in the future so that's right. one i think that was one thing the other thing was the democratization of of tools and so that includes like being able to actually afford a Photoshop to afford like the ways to make things, you know. And the other thing is like the rise of the prosumer. Mm -hmm. That is, you can actually like publish something and buy it yourself. So for instance, like publishing uh, in, in the mid 2000s, you get printing on demand publishing. So right. you and I don't have to take our ideas to a publisher. We can actually work it out ourselves, design yeah. it ourselves and put it out into the space. That's a big deal. People don't think about it that way, but that's a huge deal. Being able to share your work, you get rid of the middleman, right? So that's another thing. The other thing is the power of the smartphone and also these these social spaces where like 
isolated black nerds don't have to be isolated anymore. And you move from like these little chat rooms and like listservs to like a social space. And so you actually build a worldwide community, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing too. But the thing that lit the fire, I believe, for real, for real, is two things. One of which, well, several things. What one is um, the uh, the political aspects of like the violence against Black people, yeah. police brutality. So you had a unifying like political fire, right? You could call it the movement for Black Lives. You could call it the anti uh, police brutality initiative. Whatever you want to call, it. we were unified to think about ourselves differently. The other thing was, of course, two watershed movies one was get out first right, right. get out as a, i feel as an afrofuturist horror movie <laughs> Certainly. Right? and then also uh black panther right no so but here's the thing that was interesting about this too is that if you look at the academy right mm -hmm. as, as a as an entity as a body a lot of times the academy is like chasing trends right, right? like if you look at something like hip-hop the Academy didn't embrace hip hop at first. It was, oh, this is some kind of flash in the pan nonsense, right? right? And then 30 years later, there's an archive at Harvard, there's an archive at, Co there's an archive at Cornell. You see what I'm saying? Right. This was interesting because Afrofuturism, Black speculative culture, whatever you want to call it, there were, we were in the Academy pushing it and studying it before it broke wide. So, right. for instance, me and um, Adelie Funama, we put together two Afrofuturist think tanks called Astro Blackness where you had some of the people who are luminaries in the space now who were there and like the we're talking like 2013 2014 right and we knew this was going to happen if we had a really big thing jump off you know and i'm talking like people like sophia moja noble nalo hopkinson tanana reed du nedia korafor ronaldo anderson stacy right. robinson they were all in one space dennis cowan you know michael davis right. all these right. all these major players who were at Loyola Marymount University for two for two of these, right? We want to do a third one. And and I was a co-organizer for it. And it was essentially a think tank because no one really came to it right. <laughs> except for the people that were presenting, right? And it ended up becoming like um Nalo Hopkinson called it the, the Black Sci-Fi Church. We were just professing to each other, you know what I'm saying? And we're like supporting each other. But then what happened was when Get Out came out, made so much money, and we started looking at black speculation differently that rolled into the Black Panther. Right. And then before you know it, everybody's trying to figure out what Afrofuturism is. And we already, and we knew, we knew it. And then a lot of us became, you know, in the center of that conversation because of the fact that we've been studying it for over a decade by the time, all, close to a decade before Black Panther broke by it. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, so that's what happened. And then before you know it, it's now everywhere. And and uh, I mean, we, we just had a Carnegie Hall, like eight week eight Afrofuturism. Yes, yes. That's, that's huge. That's, uh, that's that's mainstream <laughs> you know Definitely. we are there's a there's an afro features period room on display at the met right now that, that i helped plan actually that I, you know i was part of the planning committee for and then also um you know this the the blacksonian you know the the, the African american museum they about to have an afro futurism show that opens next year right so it's serious like this is actually it's become like hip hop, like, you know, like, like it's become part of the conversation It's become naturalized to think. And I think like what's interesting about it is that it's yes, it's a cultural phenomenon, but also it centers black futurity. And that's really, really interesting, <laughs> you know? Yes. But anyway. Yeah. So those, yeah. Are, those are some of the things I think about this a lot. I, you know, I teach a whole class on Afrofuturism and aesthetics. So I actually teach three classes on Afrofuturism right now. No, excellent. I, I hear you. I hear you. So once again, if you're just joining us, this is uh, Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, here on WOL 1450 AM, 95.9 FM, where information is power. And we're joined by John Jennings. We're talking all things Afrofuturistic. So when you tell, when you say it's similar to hip hop, you know, uh, and you talk about what it is, it's certainly something that, you know, I'm a part of. I'm mm -hmm. and, and celebrating it and so forth. But at the same time, when you say it's like hip hop, that can also be concerning because you look at what happened to hip hop in terms of the way the content, in my opinion, uh, has been changed and made more palatable. And, and in saying that, you know, as, as, as bad as some folks want to define hip hop today in terms of its content, I believe that's part of the reason why it's never been more popular because I look at what hip hop had to become in order to become as popular as it is. Mm -hmm. So 
the concern is if there is a concern, what do you see happening or what do you see the potential problems of Afrofuturism down the road? Because also when you talk about its transformative powers, it can also be interpreted as threatening. Well, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a, there, there are factions out there that don't want black folk to have any agency in the future. Right. right. But at the same time, I think as long as we live in a capitalist society and as long as like the idea of, of, of these black future spaces are selling, you know, mm -hmm. that's not a bad thing to me. Right. I don't think that's a bad thing at all because it was Steven Shaviro. He's this like cultural um, critic. He said that hip hop is like a cultural hacking, right? So, you know, it, 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 hip hop wanted to be sampled and remixed. Right. It wanted to get into things, right? It's, it's right. every, you can't even sell like, you know, peanut butter without listening to hip hop. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And so we're talking about a cultural revolution. And yes, there are aspects of it that have shifted. But you, you do have real hip hop that's on the ground too. That's the yes. other thing. You do have these spaces that are still like that are still like pure hip hop. You know, yes. um, they might not be the most popular that you're listening to, but it's out there. You know, and sometimes people rise to the top, like Kendrick Lamar or someone like that. Right. You know, but it's out there, and it's, and and you can't once you let that genie out the uh, out the jar, you can't get it back in. You know, right. you can't you can't get Black Panther or like the Falcon or <laughs> right. or like you know uh, you can't get Michael Burnham back in the jar. Right, because right. because thing is, it's like the 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 cultural capital that's been generated. It makes a lot of money, mm -hmm. and as long as we're in this space, right, what did Michael Moore said? He said a, he said a capitalist will sell you the rope to hang themselves with. <laughs> <laughs> right, and I was like, that's exactly what it is. So you tell me you're gonna pay me money, you know, to sustain myself and to write radical, transformative art pieces yeah. for real, so you can. So, yeah, sign me up because <laughs> you know, at this point, it's the system that we're stuck with right now. Yes. We're not in a post-capital society. We're still in this space. The narratives that that are, that people are generating are very transformative and radical. Get people like um, Rashida Phillips, you know, who who have start like a whole like organization <clears throat> in um in Philly, right, around uh, rethinking Black time, right. This idea of Black quantum futurism, you know, that is to become like a, a international luminary because of that, because we're thinking about like reclassifying how time functions through a, an Afrocentric lens. That's that's radical, you know? Yes. And, and so the thing is, there's a lot of people out here doing this work. I mean, my friend, Ronaldo Anderson has, um, I came up with this term, the uh, the Black State of Arts Movement in 2015, because I was looking at the fact that you had people who are making Afrofuturist work, Black sci-fi work, whatever, who are also cultural organizers? They're on the ground organizers. You, you have like some like Octavius Brood that uh, Adrian Marie Brown and Walida Amarisha co-edited, right? Mm -hmm. Was like science fiction stories written by by grassroots organizers, <laughs> right? That's that's insane, right? And so I was like, man, this is kind of like the Black Arts Movement, and so but it's speculative. And I just started, like, let's call it what it is: the Black Speculative Arts Movement. And what happened is like Ronaldo liked that idea, so he expanded. At the time, he was working with uh, My Crown to start out with um, and uh, My Crown Williams. And so that what happened was that they started these these uh, almost like pop up revolutionary like, you know, arts happenings across yes. the country. And before you know it, it's become an international movement. Like there's nodes of the Black Spectral Arts Movement in other parts of Europe and Africa now. So it's like it's not so and I think I don't know if people are watching it, but it's like. It's 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 empowered people throughout the diaspora, right. which is which is wild. I mean, he curated a show at Carnegie Hall for God's sake. Yes, know? yes. You know, the Black Spectral Arts Movement had their hands all over that Carnegie Hall event. You know, right. for eight weeks. And now, if you go to their site, there's a glossary of terms that we've actually constructed to actually talk about this in a real way. So, because of the fact that you know, you know, Ronaldo studied black cultural movements and, and political movements. He understood that first of all, you have to name and claim these spaces and then try to like sculpt them. You can't control everything. That's the right. other thing. Some people are gonna create whack, empty Afrofuturist meanderings. But there are people like, you know, who who understand the culture, like myself, who are making empowering, hopefully, you know, uh forward thinking work that is that's changing how we interact with this with this uh with these stories you know excellent that's the hope you know yeah you can't control it is 
you know, you're going to have stuff that's going to come out. But OK, this was terrible. This is not Afrofuturist. This was like right. a cash grab. But then you're going to have something that's going to be like, whoa, that was the most amazing thing. And I feel empowered. And I can felt my ancestral spirit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> someone, yeah, I got you. <laughs> someone's going to be like that, you know? Right. Some people are like, oh, man, it's whack. And other people are like, man, that was pure hip hop. You know, so it's the same right. kind of thing. Again, inside of C content, outside of C form, you know? Right. So yeah, you can you can slap a you can slap like a pyramid on something and be and say oh, that's Afrofuturist. That's not true. It's actually a, it's not just form. It's also culture and history and content, right? Right. And yeah. I'm laughing because it's true because I've seen it. So oh, yeah, I know exactly sure. what you're talking <laughs> yeah. about. Um, believe it or not, man, we are coming up against it. Real quick, how can folks find you? Um, I'm all over the place, man. So you can find me. I have a I have a website, johnjenningsstudio.com. That's mm-hmm. a good place to start. Uh, I am at J.I. Jennings on Twitter and John Jennings Art on uh, Instagram. So those are, and, I'm, I, and I check all those things, you know, so. We didn't even get an opportunity to talk about your work specifically. Would you want to come back to talk more specifically about your work and also continue in this great conversation? Because I'm really enjoying this. Sure. Yeah, I would love to. Excellent. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. If you missed it, better let your friends know. They can find us, WOL, 1450 AM, 95.9 FM, and also online at WOLDCnews.com. So that's going to do it for today. Once again, thank you to Mr. John Jennings for that enlightening and engaging conversation. This is Into the Afroverse with your host, William Jones, where we're taking black folks into the future. And a special shout-out to Mr. Duke Productions, the production team behind today's episode. Thank you. Take care.